in my life on the negative side, there's been a thing that has been in my life and it really has interfered from my development spiritually and my relationship with the Lord. And it's the spirit of fear, right? The spirit of fear. And, and the spirit of fear is quite interesting is that rather than walking in your destiny that you would have in God, you walk away from that because you're afraid of what that might look like. You know, and you know, I'm still dealing with this, and, and it's it's getting un, unraveled little by little. As Paul said, fear and love does not get along. In fact, one dispels the other. Fear dispels love. Love dispels fear. It's one of the worst thing fear does to you, it kind of inhibits you from freely expressing love. So you cannot, if you don't have the inner freedom to express love, you don't have the inner freedom to receive love. So when you don't express love and when you when you don't receive love, when, when that gradually deteriorates, then there is no way you can remain in love. Whether this is true in personal lives, and it is also true in loving God. So we need to have that absolute inner freedom to receive love, to express love. Absolute inner freedom. And if we don't have that, something has terribly gone wrong. Our mission strives to spread love and light to every corner. But to truly make a difference, we need your consideration. We're not asking for your donations. Instead, we invite you to subscribe to our mission. Simply hit that subscribe button, click the like, and ring the bell button to support. Every interaction counts. Every subscription, every like, every comment helps us with the mission. Uh, Together. I learned there are three different kinds of love. There's uh, filial love, which is the uh, brotherly love, fraternal between. Child and parents, yeah. Huh? Child and parents. That's filial. Filial is between a child and a parent. Right. Yeah. And uh, agape, which is is Eucharistic or. Uh, yeah, God and us, yeah. Eucharistic things, celebration or thanksgiving, gratitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's there's Eris, uh, physical love. Or, yeah. And uh, all those things uh, are uh, kind of separate but equal. They they all have have a place, and. Uh, the second thing is, you see, love is an incredible phenomenon. It is very abstract. And we always try to kind of define it so that we can fit it into certain containers so we can understand it. So we define it as erotic, we define it as agape, we define it as filial and all those definitions so that we can understand it. None of those are true. See, love is something that cannot be defined. It is as unfathomable, it is as unmanifest, is it, it is as incredible as it gets. If we try to define it, try to fit it in and organize and all those structures, and it's not going to work. A deep desire in my soul has been this idea that rather being than being loved, because I, I, I felt particularly my mother loved me very dearly, mm. very dearly. And, but the idea was that uh, she also had these expectations Mm -hmm. for me and my my own 
idea is that, isn't it possible that I could be just loved for who I am, mm -hmm. not for what anybody else's mm -hmm. expectations are mm -hmm. for me? And in fact, you know, like when uh, I first got married, I got married to to a lady that had a lot of affinity to things related to my mother, uh, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And then at a certain point, I said, man, uh, I'm just going through a treadmill. <laughs> you know, repeating all of these uh, uh, the, these things that I've done, you know, like that. And, you know, another part of, of this type of thing is, my attitude was that my value was in pleasing other people. Right. Yeah. So, so that, you know, like I, I never felt that, that I had a, a recompensation of, of the people that were partnering with me or whatever yeah. is that their major goal was to please me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it was, well, I could satisfy some of their needs and yeah. they were fine with that, yeah. but yeah. then that's about as far as it, it would go. It was yeah. kind of, uh, yeah. uh, and many times it was kind of like a, a tit for tat type of relationship because you do this, then I will do that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in, in fact, it, it got so strange in that is uh, like my former wife would say, well, you've really been helping a lot and stuff like this. I think I may be intimate with you. Said, wow, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> Our loving turns out to be more transactional. See, our wives know when we are loving them, so they know what they give us back in return. Very transactional. Everything we do is like that. The loving itself, for all of us, it is transactional. See, it is not that abstract, unmanifest thing that is flowing in and out and, you know, it is all pervasive and, uh, you know, all-encompassing. is none of those. See, we don't get to witness love as such. The immanence of love. We never get to experience that. See, even God himself is very transactional to us. You know, he's loving us when he's answering our prayers. You know, he's loving us when, uh, you know, when he gives us what, he, you know, what we like. When we feel grateful to him, when we do that, when we do this, yeah. Then, then there is the transaction going on. See, what has that got to do with this immanence nature of God Himself and His love itself? See, there isn't. Our philosophy and also theology, they are all very intellectually ordered dualistic, um, structured schools of thought. For them, all of these elements have to be defined and put in certain square pegs, fits into the square holes. Okay, so in order to do that, you need to make square pegs and you need to make square holes. So there comes the definitions. So you begin to put in where it belongs. See, and the, the fear love as a result of being fearful, love as a result of being obedient, love as a result of being faithful. What does all of these things mean? Transactional, isn't it? The obedience as a transaction, fear as a transaction, all of these are transactional. See, I'm being fearful, I'm being faithful, I'm being obedient, so give me. That's what we are doing. None of this is true. See, hierarchy is important. See, in a puritanical society we grew up in, Hierarchy is important. Validations are important. All of these things are important. So, our loving, our work, our duties, everything that we do, it literally becomes transactional. Give and take. 
cause and effect. It all moves on that pecking order. Here we are talking about pecking orders, for instance. See, Joseph, he is not the oldest child. In fact, he was the youngest child who was given the authority over the entire family, including his older brothers and his parents. So where does the pecking order start? You see that? There is no pecking order in God's kingdom. There is no hierarchy, there is no order, there is no structure. Everything is based on this nature of immanence and transcendence. See, that's really what it is all about. Immanence and transcendence. See, you transcend all of these barriers that are controlling you. All of these transactional modes, you know, that are remaining an inhibitance for you to receive his love in its total fullness. Not just the agape part of it, not just the filial part of it, no, fullness, fullness, fullness. In all of it. See? That's really what it is. So it is not even a matter of surrendering. It actually is a matter of transcending. You see, a lot of us, we don't understand what transcending means. No. Okay. No. <laughs> see, transcending requires mastery. Without mastery, you are going to keep going back to it again and again and again. Whatever you are trying to transcend, you need to have complete mastery of it. Then when you become a master at it, you come to realize, you know what? Compared to what I am trying to realize, what I mastered is nothing. What I am trying to realize is far more superior to what I just learned, mastered about myself. So with that awareness, you pray for transcendence. Then God is going to lift you further towards Him. Okay? That lifting, it really doesn't mean that you are giving up on it. He knows how to make you go back and start using it. See, transcendence is something like, you know, for instance, you know, See, when we were little children, we learned the nursery rhymes, didn't we? Okay, after that we transcended it. But did it ever, ever go away from us? No. Never did. <laughs> See, when we have children, we just repeat it with the same excitement and with the same childishness and same everything and, and we play with them with those nursery rhymes and everything. It never left us. See, all it took us that we came back you know, to the childhood when it was necessary to come back. You see, it never goes away from us. That's exactly what transcendence is. You are not giving up anything. You are realizing that for what I need to acquire now, I don't need to carry that. That's all. Then you pray to God, God help me transcend. It's not a matter of surrender. Okay, surrender is more of a sort of a structured order, picking order thing. Don't do that. You don't need to surrender anything. God, I need you. I need your love. And this is being obstructing to me. I don't need this. Help me. Now, you know, okay, if you want to call that surrender, it's surrender. But you are helping, asking for his help to transcend from that obsession. That's all you are doing. You're transcending. See, God is forever transcending. Forever. So He is going to lift you higher and higher and higher and higher. So transcendence in spirituality is something integral. It happens all the time. 
You're going to recognize something, you're going to learn something, you're going to contemplate, and you're going to just leave it where it is, and you're going to go higher with God. God wants you to transcend. Because that's where he is. You see? So, the immanence part of it is important. That is the fullness of his love. And that is realized when you begin to transcend. Time okay. to understand wow, the love of God for me. Uh, my father died when I was three months. Uh -huh. My mother was a widow mm -hmm. with four kids mm -hmm. in the Depression time. Mm -hmm. The only we have is a house there mm -hmm. that he lived for us. Mm -hmm. Well, when we grow, my mother always teaches us that we have a father in heaven. Mm -hmm. God is our father. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she scared us. Because when we know behave, he say, he punish you. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. punish you. And then we have to cry, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Father, I'm okay. sorry. And the other thing is, I'm going to tell you one thing that's extremely important. In puritanical society, we don't understand that. You see, we think, you know, the concept of father, you know, we think he's a disciplinarian. You know, he's going to punish us. He's going to control us. He's going to tell us what to do. You know, he's going to do all of that to us. So we need to be obedient to them. At the same time, we need to fear him. We need to love him. You know, it's very puritanical nonsense. It really is. Okay, God is not bent on punishing you. You know, he is forever forgiving. Infinitely forgiving. And he is not keeping a ledger of what you have done right and wrong. He has better things to do with his life. <laughs> he is not. Okay, and, and the whole concept of that is wrong. Does he discipline you? Yes, he does discipline you. But his discipline comes with immense love. Immense love, not by way of punishment. Immense love. You see, only if you can feel that love, you're only going to feel grateful when he disciplines you. You see? For instance, you know, that, that day I lost my phone. Yeah. You know, I was very, very upset. At the same time, I was saying, yeah, I'm upset. I don't want to be upset. Didn't I? Yeah. I don't want to be upset, but I'm upset. You know, and but, but you see, I'm trying to feel grateful because I know God was helping me. Yeah. I know he was helping me. I didn't know how he was helping me, but I knew that. I was well aware of it. Okay? You know what? Even when I was entering, I had a good inclination that the phone is here and the driver has brought it back. You know? But I just want to keep it as a hope and leave it alone. But at the same time, I knew God is going to teach me something wonderful. Thank you, Lord. See, I had that attitude that was, I was reminded of that attitude through and through from the beginning to the end. And the phone was here when I walked in. Yeah, yeah. The Uber driver, she brought the phone and gave it to uh, you know, the director, to Joanna. See, <laughs> and here I was, my whole day was wasted. But God taught me something, didn't he? He taught me something. But even though I was feeling the pain and I was going through all of those kinds of things, I know the phone has warranty and it has insurance, so I'm not going to lose the phone altogether. I know it is going to cost me some deductible, so be it. If that's what you want me to do, fine. I know I'm going to be without the phone for about 24 hours or longer. 
you know, okay, if that's what you want me to do, so be it. I was prepared for all of that. You see, then I come over here and the phone is here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. See, so this is what it is. Even though he was teaching me something, even though he was trying to bring some discipline into my thought patterns and all of that, you know, which I was learning, but it comes with immense love. Not even for one moment he gave me that awareness that he is away from me. He is not paying attention to me. Yes. yes. Not even one moment he gave me that awareness. I felt his closeness through and through. See, that is what, you know, having God, the presence of God, the immanence of God all around you feels like. You know, so he is actually more of a friend. You know, that day he came, he came in the form of Alan. You know what I mean? And, and there he was, and he was communicating to me through him. And I could see that through and through. You see, and here he was, as you know, he is, he is an integral part of our life. You know, he is not away from us. He is not sitting on a throne. He is not looking us down. And, uh, you know, I mean, none of that is going on. You know, he can be as close to us as a, as a father, as a friend, as a brother, yeah. Yeah. you know, and he can be everything. But the idea that he is going to punish us, he is judging us, he is doing that, just give up. <laughs> okay, in spirituality you don't need that. In religion you do. Okay, because religion requires you to, uh, you know, confine to something, be obedient to something, and do certain things in a certain order and all of that. But when you are a spiritual seeker, seek that freedom. When you seek that freedom, you are transcending all of these. All these things that are controlling you in the form of religion, you are transcending everything. If you are not able to transcend, pray to God. God, I'm not able to give up on this kind of an attitude. I need to help me. And he'll take you. Okay? Transcendence with the help of God, it's inevitable because that is his nature. That really is his nature. He is forever transcending. You see? That is his nature. And he wants you to transcend with him. See, the only way you can get to him is adapting to that transcendence, seeking the transcendence. You know, let go of all these inhibitions, all these barriers, all these guilts, you know, all these puritanical ideas and all of that. Let go. Let go. Reach out to him. See, love is not a definition. Love is a phenomenon. You know, it's as phenomenal as the air we breathe. You know, it's as phenomenal as our own life is. Okay? You know, it is as unmanifest as it can be. Please don't define it. Okay? And please don't make orders out of it. And and sure, all my, all our lives we have used to love as a transaction, as a means to transact, means to want things, means to give things. You know, no, that's not love. That is not love. Okay, love for the sake of loving. See, you can walk up to that plant. And you can express your love to it. You know, the plant is not going to sit there thinking, you know what, Eileen, I've been sitting there ever since you were coming to this place. You never came to me before. Do you think it's going to tell you that? No. It will receive you just the way you are. Just the way you are. That is exactly how God is like. Okay?
That's exactly how God is like. You know? God loves you just the way you are. Just the way you are. Come the way you are, anytime you want to come. Okay? See the turtle in that pond? He sees you every day, even when you're sitting in the inside. When you go back, sit on that, you know, on that on that banks and 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 express your love to the turtle, he's not going to complain. He's not going to remind you of the days that you have been ignoring him. He's not going to do any of that. The turtle is going to love you back. And he's going to listen to you loving him. That's what it's going to be. That's exactly how God loves you. Okay? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay? And don't think that you need to fit in certain order. Don't think that you have to be something in order to go in front of God. You need to have no sins. You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to do that. You need none of those. None of those. Just go to him just the way you are. And I'm going to tell you something. By this own testimony, always strive to experience the presence of God in your life. When you encounter Jesus, that will definitely happen, I promise you. You will be just as transformed as this man and the woman who stood in front of him. Because nothing that comes across Jesus, nothing that encounters Jesus would ever remain the same. They would be transformed once and for all. And that transformation is for their lifetime. Okay, so with as much courage, with as much love and as much confidence, as much faith you could possibly muster up to go in front of Jesus, do it.